Scott Allen. And the next hour, you're going to be seeing the best of boulders climbing and meeting the people who have made climbing history. The unique thing about Boulder as a front range city is the closeness to these giant rocks called the Flatirons. Climbing in Boulder has been recorded for almost a hundred years, though it is likely the Ute and Arapaho Indians were the first to climb these Flatirons. The earliest recorded rock climb in Colorado was in 1906, with Floyd and Earl Millard's ascent of the thousand foot east face of the third Flatiron. Back in those days, they wore hobnail boots, and in dry weather, some climbed in stocking feet. Later, a tight-fitting pair of baseball shoes with soft rubber soles became the favorite footwear. Even in the early days, climbing was a social activity for both men and women. As husband and wife climbing partners, Ma and Pa Greenman showed the way to other climbers at the turn of the century. Thanks to the Greenmans, we have an extensive collection of old photographs to connect us with these early climbers. One of the reasons people began climbing in Boulder was because of the geology of this unique mountain backdrop. Boulder's geology is unique to the North American continent. Right here, the Great Plains hit the Rockies, bending the flat sedimentary layers into near vertical positions. The Flatirons in El Dorado Canyon consist of these bent layers of sandstone and have actual bits and pieces of the ancient Rocky Mountains embedded in them. The ancient Rockies were worn down, ground into sediments carried by streams and dropped into several layers, hardening over time into stone. The recent Rockies, made of granite, have busted up through these layers to create a remarkable climber's playground. The rock is old, but the history is relatively new. The third flat iron has attracted strange ascents, including a speed ascent clock at faster than 10 minutes. Once a university fraternity painted the letters C-U on the east face of the third flatiron. One of my favorite stories happened in the 1950s when Dale Johnson climbed the third flatiron in roller skates. Gary Neptune streaked naked up the third in the early 1970s. I asked old timer Vinnie Elwood what he saw at the summit of the third flatiron. The thing I remember, one of the things I remember about the third flatiron was that there was a up in the top, there's, a, I don't know if you guys remember this baseball uh, player, Ty Cobb. His initials were up there engraved beautifully. It looked like he spent two or three days up there putting these things in. They were about, letters about an inch high and about a quarter of an inch deep. <laughs> and I don't know if they're still up there or not. Men and women climbers have been enjoying these flat irons for years. I asked Janet Robertson, author of The Magnificent Mountain Women, to tell us more about the ladies who climbed. There really weren't many women in Boulder's early rock climbing. In fact, there weren't many men. Um, there was a club formed of Texans, ironically, here at Chautauqua in the late 1800s. It was largely social. They went on picnics. They would take hikes. They didn't actually begin climbing until after 1900. A few, two men, climbed the third flat iron, and thereafter it was sort of the private domain of the Rocky Mountain climbers. But women did go along, and gradually women started climbing the third flat iron with the men, wearing long dresses and great big hats. They were really well-dressed. We'd never consider climbing in garb such as they wore. But as nearly as I've been able to determine from my research, it wasn't until the 70s that women started consciously either leading what they'd previously been on with a man or climbing with another female partner. Coral Bowman was an exponent of that. Diane Hunter, who, who fell tragically to her death on a relatively simple descent, 
she was a climber of note, a, a woman climber of note, even before Coral Bowman. Coral said she derived some inspiration from Diane Hunter. Beginning in the 70s, which was the rise of feminism in other areas too, I'd say is when women's climbing began to take off in the Boulder area. The Maiden turned out to be a lot of fun just to climb that for the first time too. And uh, uh, we did, did that on Saturday. We went twice to that to get it done properly because there were you could go up or down and we were never sure which way to go. And there, were no, there wasn't anything graphic to tell you just how to do it. You had to work it out yourself. And uh, that was a lot of fun that way because the routes were not really clear at all. I mean, there's only been a few ascents prior to us. So it was, um, it was really exciting to get back in there. Well, I went up with a young lady that was a biology major and she had to collect some shrimp, freshwater shrimp. And she, she really, we really did. That was supposed to, people kid me about that. And as a, as a ruse for taking this young lady up there, but in fact, it was really true. And she showed me how to do some things. She, I always used to pendulum across that first pitch on the north side a little bit, you know, that first section that's kind of five, seven. And she said, you don't have to do that. Let me show you. She climbed right over it, and I thought, well, okay, <laughs> this is the way it's done. Interestingly enough, you know, there was no interest in El Dorado at that point. And that does run, really, except for Ivy Baldwin's wire walk. Uh, El Dorado had very little interest. To listen to climber Pat Ament, you hear the boulder of yesterday, where the Flatirons held as much adventure as those found by Huck and Tom on the Mississippi. Remarkable individuals like Baker Armstrong, Leighton Corr, Huntley Ingalls, and Larry Dawkey geared up for vertical adventures practically in their own backyards. I fell into the company very quickly of Dale Johnson and Baker Armstrong and, uh, and Leighton Corr. And of course I had my own uh, junior high school pals like Larry Dawkey. And every day after school we couldn't wait till that three o'clock bell and we'd race up on foot to the base of the flat irons and climb in our bare feet. We didn't have good climbing shoes then and boulder along the base of the flat irons. And There has been a cast of colorful characters in the history of El Dorado Canyon. Even before the adventures of rock climbers, an amazing stuntman found his own excitement high over South Boulder Creek. For years, a steel cable was stretched from the top of the Bastille to the top of the Wind Tower. Between 1906 and 1948, Ivy Baldwin, stuntman, balloonist, tumbler, parachutist, and circus clown, walked the wire 89 times the last on his 82nd birthday. Mostly though, people have gotten their thrills from rock climbing in the canyon. April 17th, 1964 was the first day I set foot in El Dorado with my two friends who were also 13 uh, with you know questionable climbing gear and 
very little idea of what was up and what was down. And somebody pointed to the bulge and said, that's a fairly easy climb there, a five, six climb. Uh, so we set off, set off climbing the bulge and these two twins I was with were much bolder and stronger than me and they led the first couple pitches. We did two pitches and I remember just being terrified and then we finally rappelled off. But that was my first day in El Dorado. And the driving force of climbing in the 60s, anybody would have to say, was, was latent core in Colorado, in Boulder, uh, nationally, internationally as an American. He climbed a lot in the Alps, climbed the north face of the Eiger, the, the uh, Aigui de Fou. He's a very, very active, very aggressive, very charismatic person, and, and everybody was uh, influenced by him. A lot of people followed from his achievements and his style, uh, Pat Ament and Larry Dalkey, and uh, he, inf he was so influential that you can't underestimate the impact of Leighton Core in the 60s. He was the man. In a, in a nutshell, he had a tremendous life force. Uh, he was just overflowing with life. He was just, uh, when you went on a climb with him, he was, you know, he was uh, driving about 20 miles over the speed limit and raving and joking, and uh, he was just boiling over with enthusiasm and life force all the time. Uh, sometimes that got to be a little bit wearing. For example, you know, you'd make a road stop and you'd feel like relaxing for a few minutes, and uh, he just uh, wolfed down his food and, and gulped down his beer. Let's get going, let's get going. So uh, it, had, uh, it had some downside too, but um, everyone, uh, everyone wanted to climb with him, even though they often got half scared to death because although it wasn't necessarily pleasant, it was always inspiring. Uh, he also had a very keen sense of, uh, of humor. He was, had, he was always uh, joking and, and laughing on these trips, and, and uh, he had, a, he had a really a pretty keen wit. There's his famous comment about sandstone climbing, for example. He said, one thing about sandstone, you can't take it for granted. And another famous comment he made about desert climbing was that, uh, this, and this is paraphrasing Mallory, he said, the reason we climb these towers is because they won't be here much longer. <laughs> tell us about the climbing route, Psycho. Uh, well, i tell you one thing about Psycho. Uh, you don't have the Psycho experience unless you are scared half to death and think you really might die. That's the Psycho experience. <laughs> so, uh, it's that lead just above the roof that's so bad. The, uh, the roof itself is, uh, you know, you got very good protection on that, but there was... Uh, essentially no protection on the on the lead above that and at a certain point if Leighton had come off he would have just cratered into the ground and then he didn't have a very secure stance after he got above there and it was just terrible it was just a matter of uh, hanging on by an eyelash and making the next move and uh, just before you came off and, and that sort of thing and uh, it was just really awful so on the way back to the car uh, we were discussing what are we going to name this climb and at that time Alfred Hitchcock's movie had, uh, had just come out and I thought to myself well why not name it uh, Psycho and then I thought well no maybe that's a little bit too silly and just as I had that thought Leighton said let's name it Psycho <laughs> now, there's now a bolt in that uh, in that bed section and they ought to be but I've heard that even with the bolt, sometimes people get pretty scared on it. It's just a really spooky climb, or at least it was for us then. I don't know what high standard climbers think of it now. Maybe it's nothing to them, but it certainly was spooky in those days. Informality and uh, spontaneity of it, I think, is what was most different from, from now. And, uh, of course, it's a time that can only happen once. The uh, amazing thing was that you could just get together so informally and then do a climb which would later be in the books and in those days almost anything could happen and that, that was just part of the excitement of it. It, was, it was just uh, wonderful the way you, you never knew what might happen next it was just a matter of imagination who you ran into El Dorado is a special area I've climbed yeah you know several other places I've climbed the Dolomites and uh, in Europe and in the Alps and uh, various places and, and El Dorado has really good rock. It, it's better than most any rock you find, uh, or you know, a lot of rock that you find. Uh, and it has a special appeal to me because I learned to climb in Colorado. We did routes all over the place. I don't know, we, we did uh, a couple of 
first ascents down El Dorado at least, and we did some up in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, I went climbing with Leighton uh, on a, uh, like Hallis Peak, the first time I ever did Hallis Peak, the third bucket was, was with Leighton. Uh, so we did, we climbed around quite a lot here in the local area. The climbing scene in Boulder, as of 1961 when I first arrived, uh, was a mixture of interest in direct aid and in free climbing. Uh, I'd say about a 50-50 mix, and this is also the way it had been in California. In other words, people were a lot more interested in direct aid in those days than they would be today. Uh, there had been a movement, perhaps started in California, to try to free climb some of the aid routes. And uh, this had all already been progressing for some time. And uh, when I came here, it was natural for me to think in terms of trying to do some of the aid routes uh, all free. And of course, this is a trend which has been going on ever since. Um, I climbed a little bit with Bob Culp. And in 1962, uh, he and I free climbed T2 in El Dorado. And I believe this was the first time that it had been, it had been done or led completely free, although all or most of the climb had been done various pitches, uh, all free uh, from time to time, mostly by late and core. And uh, I remember particularly the first pitch at the bottom of the climb. Uh, the scene at the base of T2 looks entirely different today as of 1993 than it did back in 1962. Um, there was a tail of spike, three and a half to four feet high, sticking up out of the ground right at the base of the climb. And uh, we made as much use of that as we could to try to get over the first overhang, which had been done uh, by direct aid previously. And um, we used, uh, we placed a bolt as high as we could and use that for protection. And it actually, in climbing the first pitch, we didn't stand on the, we didn't start from the top of the tail of spike, but a little ways down the slope. And if you look at that area today, all the handles have been ripped off over the years and there's hardly anything left. So a, uh, a climb which was just a medium hard 5.9, let's say, in 1962, has been upgraded at least to 5.10 at the present time. Uh, as I uh, first climbed that first pitch, I pulled off a great big uh, doorknob-shaped um, hold, which would have been a very handy thing to use, but on the very first uh, free ascent, it went by the boards and has never been seen since. And the tail of spike has also disappeared over the years, and the ground has been so trampled down underneath there that it must have been lowered by two or three feet just by the traffic moving underneath the route. So all in all, the uh, ascent of T2 is entirely different today, and I must say much harder today than it was back then. The 1970 period was, of course, a period of transition from, free, from aid climbing to free climbing, and I, I watched that happen. And I think it was uh, a continuation of a trend that had already started in uh, at least the early 60s and probably earlier than that. Um, about that same time, people stopped using pitons and started using nuts. This was, this was another big uh, transition, and I think that occurred probably in the early 1970s. And of course, I was a piton climber, and so were all the Californians. And for some of us, it was kind of a hard transition to make from a piton, where you have the satisfaction of really hammering on the thing, you know, and you can tell when you hammer on it whether it's going to hold you or not. If it's a good piton, it has a nice ringing sound, which you don't hear anymore. Um, and so psychologically, uh, it was hard for some of us to, to give up that sense of security that we had with pitons, you know, and start trusting these funny little nuts that you, you just place in a crack with your fingers. Uh, Royal had spent some time in England, in Europe, and he came back with the idea of nuts and he tried to popularize their use. And uh, I resisted it, I guess, although I was not really an active climber in those days, in the 70s. 
But finally, I uh, I was persuaded, and I started using them. In fact, I uh, I made some wooden chocks out of various kinds of wood, uh, which I experimented with, and which I've been using um, quite frequently uh, in the years ever since the 1970s. The torch has been passed to a new generation, or maybe a couple of new generations since my time. And in looking back, uh, these people need to keep in mind, I think, uh, that things were the same difficulty in that period for us as they are now for the modern generation. It's a funny thing, isn't it? Uh, although the standards change, that is, they become higher as time goes by, still the, the difficulty and the amount of effort, both physical and mental, required in climbing seems to be the same in every period. And as I look back earlier to periods before my own, uh, I still see that at work. Uh, climbers were venturing into the unknown and, and sticking their necks out in ways that were just as difficult for them, even though they were doing climbs which have a lower decimal rating uh, than today. And I guess looking back over the history of climbing, I'm I'm always, um, always thinking that uh, the old timers and the modern set and the people in between all had sort of the same standards uh, of their time. And the amount of effort that went into all these uh, climbs had to be just about constant over the whole period. The Naked Edge is probably the most historic, the most famous classic route in Boulder. It's known all over the world. People come from all over to climb it. It's been a uh, it's been a destination climb. And people came here with the intent of doing that route. And I did. That was that was true for me too. That's one of the climbs that brought me to Boulder. Was uh, the Naked Edge. Before I moved here, when I was in graduate school, uh, I saw a climbing magazine. I think it was Summit actually, the old Summit magazine had a picture of the naked edge on the, uh, the cover from the second pitch. Two guys up on the second pitch shot from down by the, uh, the uh, South Boulder Creek with a telephoto lens. A very inspiring, very dramatic picture. And when I saw that, I just thought, good God, I have got to climb that route. And then, of course, I opened it up and saw that it was a 511 route. And I went, oh, no, I'll never climb it. But it's still, it's one of the reasons I came here. I wanted to climb the naked edge. The 70s was uh, a heyday for the, the free climbing. That, that's when free climbing and the so-called clean climbing techniques really got going. And uh, there were a lot of people, Duncan Ferguson, Steve Wunsch, Jim Erickson. You could go on uh, with a list of 20 or 30 uh, names of great climbers around here who were really influential. Pat Ament and Jim Erickson always vied for uh, the... Uh, front row or, or center stage and uh, maybe not deliberately maybe deliberately and probably some of both uh, just because they were doing what they loved to do but also I think there was a real sense of competition between them and uh, they, they even had competing guidebooks for a while and competing interests along those lines. The climbing scene started to change fairly dramatically in the 70s. In the late 60s it was still a pretty small group of people who were involved in, in, in uh, climbing or who were really pushing the climbs. There were probably only a handful of people who were really, you know, climbing fairly regularly, maybe 10, 12, 14 people who were really, you know, going out every weekend or so. It wasn't all that popular, but by, by the early to mid-70s, you know, that number had probably doubled or tripled. There were a lot more people who were out there really trying to do hard free climbs, whereas when I first came here in 1967, there were only like two people who were really interested in that, you know, Amanda and Dave Rurick and, you know, a few people like that, you know, did some things, but nobody was really, you know, spending a lot of time trying to free climb new routes. Everything in Boulder then practically was unclimbed. So you could go into El Dorado and there were thousands of possible climbs to do that had never been done by anyone. And you'd have the entire canyon to yourself. It was utterly beautiful and you were there alone and you could hear the sounds of the river and, and the breezes and winds that blew through there and, and the memories from those times are so vivid because they struck so deeply in our souls and that um, 
there's kind of a longing for those times. They'll never be here again because Colorado's filled with climbers and and uh, that particular golden age is is long gone for all of us. But I feel very blessed to have been a part of that, to have been in the right place at the right time. We asked Jim Erickson about the El Dorado classic, The Naked Edge. That was one of those climbs that was just sort of one of those wonderful isolated moments in your life that, that just happened to work out very well by mistake, you know. Um, I remember when, when we did it, you know, uh, that was one of the climbs that I had sort of pointed at because it was a climb I wanted to do and, you know, I guess to some degree it was a climb that made me very famous, but certainly when I did it at the time, I never thought that it would ever be something that I would ever become famous for having done. You know, it just seemed like the next climb to do. We were concentrating a couple of years before that at doing most of the established hard climbs in the area, and when we'd done all those, then we, you know, we were working on some new things, and eventually we tried a couple of things, and, then it, and eventually we kept thinking, well, maybe that maybe we should go put some effort into this. And so I made a couple of attempts over a couple of years. You know, I'd go up once and make it up 30 feet and fall off, and and I'd say, well, maybe next year, you know, that kind of thing. But it, but eventually it, it it fell together really well. Um, actually, it was October 3rd in 1971, which is like 20. I don't know, 22 years now, just a couple days ago. Yeah, Sunday, 22 years ago. Yeah, it was a beautiful day just like this, one of those beautiful October days. It was perfectly clear, and Duncan and I got up at 4.30 in the morning or something and drove down to El Dorado at first light. We sold it up all the way to the base of the first pitch, you know, while it was still almost dark, because we thought it might take us all day because it was like five pitches long, and, and uh, <laughs> it did, did take us most of the day. I guess we got done about three, but it was hard. You know, it was really hard, and it was sort of beyond anything that... That, that we had done at the time, you know, just as far as continuous difficulty. I don't think technically it was, it was as hard as most of the, the hardest climbs around, but it wasn't any harder really, but it was hard because it had four or five really hard pitches on it. Because when I first started climbing, um, you know, the, the emphasis was on doing a route your first try, and so you couldn't really do that hard a climb. You know, the hard climbs at that time were, were you know, 511 Bs and Cs maybe. And uh, I guess maybe a few people had, had flashed 511Ds. But then there was sort of this big push to actually do harder routes. And Steve Wunsch in particular is someone that I uh, think of when I think of someone who sort of bridged that gap between, you know, on-site climbing to working routes. And probably the Psycho Roof was uh, the best example of that. I think he spent, you know, weeks climbing it. I remember people in the Boulder Mountaineer saying that he'd never do it. He was just wasting his time and why was he up there trying to do that because it would never go. And um, People just didn't realize that if you worked on a climb long enough, eventually you could do it. And, uh, you know, sure enough, he popped it off. And the climb was probably 12C at that time, which was really hard because the other other hard climbs at the time, you know, weren't even 512. Nobody even knew what 512 was. Yeah, I remember an article about it that said, you know, in big bold letters, it said harder than 511. And, you know, everyone thought, well, that, that can't be. I mean, how can anything be harder than 511? And uh, once people sort of got that mindset, um, they were able to do a lot of really hard climbs. Um, other climbs like Poly Gap uh, were done and uh, Skip Grin climbed Poly Gap and Jim Collins climbed Genesis and people started doing some really hard routes and, and all of a sudden it was, you know, there was sort of a, of a, a big change of, of mindset there. People started thinking um, that it wasn't so important to do it your first try. It, it was sort of important to see how hard a route you could actually do in a reasonable amount of time. You know, you didn't want to spend two years on a route or anything. But there was no um, disgrace in, you know, spending three or four days on a climb and then eventually doing it. So it was a pretty interesting transition. Christian Griffith has to be mentioned foremost, I think, in uh, the 1980s. But there were really two directions going on there. There was the sort of clean climbing, the run it out mentality. Uh, do the hardest possible climbs with the least possible devices. That was still going on into the 80s. Um, you know, Jim Erickson wouldn't even use chalk and, and claim that some of the climbs around here were done with direct aid because they were free climb with chalk the first time, which is partly his joke, but partly it was serious too, I think, because he never actually used chalk. 
but um, so we had two different things going. It wasn't like, like uh, Alex Sharp, the, the British climber who moved here and, and took up residency, uh, really pushed the limits in that way. The terrifying climb during the uh, early 80s that uh, has really fallen into disuse and into obscurity because they're so hard and they're so scary that really nobody wants to do them. And in spite of the predictions in the book, uh, Godfrey and Shelton's book, Climb, that the climbs of the future, that the trends of the future would be greater difficulty with worse pro. It was just the opposite in terms of the pro. Greater difficulty, yes, that was the future. But people don't want to die climbing. So Christian came along and started doing his roots. I think Paris Girl was his first um, big step in that direction. The root got chopped. He rightly put it back in, as far as I'm concerned. Who's to say, you know, who, what's right for another person? You know, it's kind of, I always take a laissez-faire approach to these things, that we have to live and let live. When I started, you know, putting in bolts, and, uh, you know, I was one of the first people to do that in Colorado, and probably even in the country, um, at least in the sport climbing way of doing things. Um, there were so many great lines, you know, mainly Rainbow Wall, Destachado, Paris Girl. You know, a lot of those roots are just, they're real awesome. They're beautiful verb, you know, they're some of the best things around. And it's partially due to the fact that they're so blank. There is so little there. It makes them really spectacular and really unique. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't that I was trying to find the hardest thing in the world. I think Death of Shadow actually was the hardest thing in the country probably when I did it. But I didn't know that, you know. It was just a beautiful looking line of holes out across a huge face, you know, you know big old hanging face, which was like There's something begging to be coined. Let's go up there. Yeah. It's nineteen what is it, nineteen eighty eight, um, and looking for an area to put up some new roots and sick of climbing in an elbow, kind of really burnt on what's going on there. And uh, Paul Piana is uh, leaving town, moving uh, back to the Black Hills, and I run into him, uh, I guess, uh, a couple days before he leaves town, and uh, he drops this hot tip on me. He, uh, you know, I'm asking him about routes he had been working on and project he, projects he left unfinished, and he leans over and says, dude, Fern Canyon, check it out. So the next day or that next weekend, I think it was actually uh, headed up to Fern Canyon, didn't even know where it was, had to look it up in the uh, High Over Boulder book. Head up with the posse, uh, Greg, Paul, some other guys I've been climbing with at the time. And uh, we walk into Fern Canyon and the first thing we see is this giant block which ends up becoming super fresh. My jaw hits my chest. I can't believe that this route has never, hasn't been done yet. You walk up the trail a little farther and there's three gigantic ridges in there and we see what becomes the chains of love roof. And again, my jaw is just dra dragging on the trail at this point. And, and we just keep walking up this trail and we see the arete that becomes the violator and uh, we see the arete which becomes cream puff. And, we spend that whole summer, 88, just going nuts, running up and down the trail with uh, big packs with 10 ropes in there and equipment and everything. The sport that I grew up with was fundamentally changing. And some changes that began is the sport climbing revolution. And those began to trickle in um, to climbing consciousness all over the country. And people realize that, my God, look at these beautiful swaths of rock that are climbable but unprotectable unless you rappel down and pre-protect them. And so it was really an exciting renaissance. And there were entire canyons. All of these rocks were untouched with those eyes. Nobody looked at the rocks in quite those ways. I mean, sure, people had dreamed of a particular uh, space between crack systems, but nobody had actually stepped forward really to challenge the most outrageously overhanging sections. And so it was super to come here to an area with rocks suitable for that kind of development and sort of have everything. For every climbing route in Boulder, a pedestrian would rightly ask the question, why? What's the point of climbing? 
I think I've found something here that begins to answer. Listen to these words of Patrick Elanger, French climber. Climbing is not a sport, it's a way of life. The way you get to the top expresses who you are, your values, the type of life you were living. Climbing takes place in nature, it is a school of life. In many ways, climbing is a union of danger and beauty. And if you think about it, climbing is an art form. Well, I think art comes into climbing in, in two ways. One is that if you do a new climb, you are creating a piece of art. And I really have been working on a new climb this summer, and it's really struck me as never before that it is a form of art that you're creating, only uh, unlike visual art, if you go look at a painting or a sculpture, you, you use your eyes, mostly. Uh, it's a visual experience. Or you might listen to music, and it's an auditory experience. Or you might see a, a play production, and it's both. You know, there's different ways that art is experienced. Maybe even eating, maybe even good food is an art form. Uh, but a climb, it struck me, is an art form that the first ascensionist created, but the only way to experience it is with your body. And you go and you experience it with your body, and there's visual aspects to it, as well as actually the feel, the moves. And your body has to be trained to the point that, that you're capable of doing it. So I just recognize it as an art form that you experience with your whole body. Uh, that's one aspect, I think, of climbing as art. The other aspect is, I think, when you're actually climbing, moving, it is like dance. For me, the art of climbing, for anybody, is to start at whatever level you're at and to progress, to move in, in some direction. And, you know, if you, start, if you start at 5'11 and you go to 5'14, or if you start at 5'2 and you go to 5'7, you still have that same feeling of, of moving and getting better and, and, and learning something about yourself and your body and your mind in a situation that's potentially dangerous. It's a quick ride on a bicycle to our next climbing area, Boulder Canyon. Boulder Canyon is some of the oldest on the planet. This quality granite monzonite is one and a half billion years old. Uh, Boulder Canyon is a granite climbing area and a lot of it's crack climbing and there's not really many sport routes there and things aren't really steep. They don't tend to be overhung but there's some really cool um, crack climbs there and some really good bolted arrests there that are really fun and uh, a lot of really old roots, um, roots on the castle, like uh, Country Club Crack and Athlete's Feet, those climbs have been around forever. And uh, there's a lot of tradition behind those climbs. I asked Cleve McCarty to share how he and Ted Roulard climbed the first ascent of Country Club Crack on Castle Rock. Really, uh, we thought that would be a stunning thing to do is to go straight up that crack and, and people say, oh no, you can't do that. It's, much too steep and there's no way. And so we took it as a challenge, and Ted Roulard and I, and went up um, the one afternoon and put the route in up to what we call Country Club Ledge. That's the main first belay spot that's, we think it's the first belay spot. It's about 75 feet up. And then left the ropes overnight. This was a fixed route. <laughs> <laughs> and then came back the next day after a jolly good breakfast in North Boulder and went up there and took some actually country club, it's called country club malt liquor, a little like beer, and took it with us up there and just to, as sustenance along the climb and it got named from this country club malt liquor beer that we had with us. I believe I did the first free ascent of what's now called Coffin Crack. And, uh, this was supposed to be a pun on Cussin' Crack, which is right around the corner, but I don't know if that pun ever uh, was very much appreciated by people. And uh, Pat Ament was climbing with me in those days. He was a young climber just beginning to uh, embark on his climbing career. And uh, he and I did the first ascent of Curving Crack. That was all Pat's climb, though. He uh, looked at it, and I think he had maybe climbed with Abe previously, and uh, he led the... Uh, the hard part. <laughs> 
Well, climbing in Boulder Canyon is fun to me because the people are a little more split up and, and separated than they are in some other places. For example, El Dorado seems like the people tend to be more concentrated. So I kind of like climbing in Boulder Canyon just because uh, you can pick out places where there's not so many people. It's, you know, it doesn't feel so crowded. And there's an awful lot of crags in Boulder Canyon that are small little crags, may only have a few roots on that particular crag. And at the same time, you can go there and um, pick what you want to do and not compete with a lot of people. Um, I also like it just because it's complex too. It's, it's an area that without getting to know it, uh, you, you may be a little confused at first and that kind of thing. And that's part of the appeal to me. It seems like it has a little more flavor of a, an adventure to me. Uh, the first set of Where Eagles Dare, wow, see if I can remember back that far, let's see. Um, it was interesting because at that time I wasn't really that familiar with Boulder Canyon, neither were my two partners that I did it with, uh, Scott Woodruff and Brad Gilbert. And it's up on Blob Rock, and Blob Rock is a, is a, a rock that doesn't have a whole lot of obvious lines from the road, and it's actually not that popular a rock, and yet uh, once you get up closer, you realize that there's quite a bit of steep rock there, and it, it's a fun place to climb. Um, you just have to kind of learn where the lines are that exist already and figure out where they go. And it's, it's a little bit of a devious rock in terms of root finding, that kind of thing. Um, where Eagles Dare was fairly obvious in the upper section where we wanted to go. In the bottom section, it wasn't quite so obvious. It's on some slabs and things like that. It was, a, it was an interesting venture because we basically walked up there one day, had done a couple other routes on the rock, and looked up there, and this looked, the upper part at least, looked like a very obvious thing to do. So um, we, we spent one day, did the first pitch there, and came back uh, a little bit later and did the whole climb. So it was, it was quite, a, quite a good adventure. It had some good exposure on the third pitch. You traverse out on a big flake to uh, an overhanging situation. It was quite exciting definitely in those days. Still is. Climbers of any generation need some kind of way to express themselves and you know when an area is played out in a certain way you have to look for e either new more obscure areas or you have to find ways to do harder climbs and one of the ways to do harder climbs is obviously to you know go down and put protection in so you can go up and lead hard, continuously harder and harder blank faces between the cracks because we really didn't get into to that very much you know I did you know when I did Hare City the first time um, actually John Barons and I uh, rappelled down and put a, a bolt in that we could have done it without a bolt or I think we used two but um, we wanted to you know set up a route that would be a classic route that had some reasonable amount of protection I and mean, we could have done it as a much more scary climb but it, it, it just felt like you know this was a classic line and it's something people would want to do I mean I think when you're doing a new route you have a right to make it a horror climb or to make it a, a, a trade route you know to a certain degree and, and so to that extent I don't think it's so bad that you know people go up and uh, repel down things and put, put bolts in you know I mean I think if it makes for the enjoy an enjoyable experience for those who follow then I can see it, you know, if you're going to put a bolt in, I, I can't see any reason not to put it in well. You know, that makes perfect sense to me. You know, if, you're, if you're going to put a bolt in, it should be a good, strong bolt. It should last you know, hundreds of years or dozens of years or anything like that. But I think people are trusting their lives to it. It should be something that's very safe. The biggest controversy, I think, ever to hit the sport of climbing was the so-called bolt controversy of the the mid and late 80s, which actually raged on into the 90s as well, right through the turn of the decade. I asked Bob Toll, the ranger of El Dorado Canyon State Park, and Mia Axon, a member of the Action Committee for El Dorado, to tell us more about the official bolt controversy. Um, the conflict itself really began, I would say, and I might get my dates mixed up towards the end of the 80s, um, maybe 89 or something, when People would uh, talk to us, uh, climbers specifically would talk to us uh, about the, the problem as they perceived it, the new routes going in. But primarily it was because of uh, the subjective nature of people, I should say climbers, excuse me, um, chopping routes. And that did cause us quite a bit of concern. Um, it's a natural environment, so it was one of those allowable things with uh, fixed hardware being installed on rock faces all the way up through you know the 80s but when people started to chop things and uh, obviously people get up to a 
point of protection and, and not have it there. Um, and especially the, uh, the chopping really was more of a defacing in, in our opinion. So that really kind of set off the alarms, if you would. Um, the other thing that, that uh, climbers were telling us was that uh, there was too much route crowding going on where people would, climbers would try to put in a new route in between other routes. And that was the number one concern that we had, excuse me, the number one complaint that we had from climbers is that, you know, coming up to us and, and asking, well, what are you going to do about it? And I'd ask them. <laughs> Uh, what, what would you like us to do about it type thing and, and of course nobody really had any answers uh, to that point but the solutions that came out of that the, the group recommended uh, three alternatives to every proposal should we ban bolting continuous should we come up with uh, for example with the bolting conflict uh, <coughs> was either total prohibition well into the future um, going back to the way it was which was no government controls whatsoever, letting the community regulate itself. And then the third one was somewhat, uh, I don't want to use the word compromise, but it was somewhere in between where it would be a permit system. We closed some areas, uh, well over 50% of the park, I believe, was closed to any future building, and the rest of it was open to a system whereby we would try to involve the community um, in a permit system itself. I've been real pleased with with the uh, with the system. There's been it fails me now how many new routes have been put in, in the last two or three years, but uh, I think there's probably been about ten routes. So the whole system has slowed down quite a bit. There's also been some activity generated through ACE and their support, ACE being the Action Committee for El Dorado, um, to to look at the entire picture of climbing impact and try to mitigate that. So. Um, we've been real happy with it. I think there's been a, f in fact, I know there's been a few quote renegade or illegal routes being put in, but I expect that. But uh, to be very honest with you, I would say that 99% uh, of it's it's working. When the bolting controversy in Boulder arose in, in 1988, El Dorado Canyon made a commitment to work with the climbers in developing a climbing management plan. And subsequently, in 1992, um, ACE was ACE was formed. And its primary function is to help El Dorado Canyon in helping get climate input into the climate management plan that El Dorado has. Um, ACE consists of a seven-member board. Five of those members represent climbing organizations. And they include the Access Fund, the American Alpine Club, the American Mountain Foundation, the American Guides Association, and the Colorado Mountain Club. Um, there are also two members at large, and one of the strong points of ACE, one of the, the reasons why it's a strong organization is because it indeed represents climbers, not, not just one segment of climbers, but by having representatives from all those different nonprofits on the ACE board, there's a wide spectrum of climbers that are represented. One of the first things that the ACE committee did was to form the Fixed Hardware Review Committee. And this Fixed Hardware Review Committee is a group of five people from the climbing community. Um, the committee is selected annually. And the committee reviews all applications that come into El Dorado for, of people that want to put new routes in or change, change the fixed hardware on existing routes dramatically. Um, and the committee has public meetings at least three times a year and they make recommendations to El Dorado Canyon State Park as to whether the routes should be going in or not. ACE is a model. I think that it, it, every area needs to be looked at individually and you can't assume that ACE is the right model for all other climbing areas. Overall, I, I just encourage climbers to use their, their best judgment and, and I also encourage climbers to get involved in both climbing nonprofit organizations and, and to, to care for the, the lands that they climb on, to, to really have, have good stewardship over the places where they climb. Learn your craft well and, and learn how to place protection. Learn how to make very, very cool, rational judgments about what you're doing and what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. And that's the one thing I learned from soloing. You had to be able to keep that rational cool head and when you were up there if you got to the point even if it was a climb that was well below your ability if it didn't feel 
like it was something that was secure enough, I would turn around and go down. You have to be able to draw that line and say no. Climbers as a whole um, are a very interesting group, and uh, I've, I've really enjoyed um, almost all of my relationships with, uh, with, with climbers as a group. They, uh, they're in some ways no different than any other group that has very specific interests, you know, bird watchers, boaters, uh, whatever. The one thing that I will remember long after I'm gone is the passionate feel that people have for this resource. And, Climbing techniques and attitudes have changed so much that I can't imagine a better place for a man or woman to take up rock climbing than in the Boulder area. Well, I hope you've enjoyed Vertical Boulder and are able to hold on to a little bit of the history behind these rocks. Of the many people who've contributed, there are a lot more who we've had to leave out. For a more comprehensive history, I highly recommend Godfrey and Chelton's book, Climb. Well, thanks again for joining us, and I hope to see you on your next adventure in Vertical Boulder.